Emma Hale Smith was often referred to as the elect lady. What was that lady all about? Well, we're going to talk about her next on Polygamy. What love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, all of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me, and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. This is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And I am your host, Doris Hansen. It's always a privilege to be able to share what we have uh, for you each week on this program. And tonight, we are going to be focusing on the story of Emma Smith. You know, the polygamists are more honest than the LDS church is in at least one way, and that is how they deal with their history. The LDS church publications have sanitized their history so much that it takes diligence and effort to find the truth hidden under tons of fabricated information and cover-ups to cover up what they've previously covered up. The truth about Joseph Smith and Emma's history is no exception. I recently watched a DVD about Emma Smith's life and her marriage to Joseph Smith. And even though Emma's marriage was plagued with rumors of her husband's sexual indiscretions and then she was forced to accept polygamy, that film had no references at all to polygamy until the very end of the film when polygamy was just briefly mentioned. In watching that film, it left the viewer with the idea that Joseph and Emma had a blissful, monogamous marriage, and they didn't. The contents of that film was either a planned deception, or the powers that be are derelict in their responsibilities to be truthful about their history. They know that Joseph Smith was a polygamist, and they know that Emma knew Smith was messing around with other women. She just didn't know how many. Why didn't they tell it like it really was? You know, admitting chunks of truth is dishonest. There needs to be truth-telling in Mormonism, both in the fundamentalists as well as the mainstream organizations. Why don't they think that their members deserve to hear the truth? We do pray that at some point the members of all Mormon organizations will acquire some boldness to rise up against the leadership who is hiding the truth and insist that the truth be told to them without fabricating justification. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And they could begin with the story of Joseph and Emma Hale Smith. Our guest tonight is Dorothy Catlin. She has previously portrayed on our show, um, on separate shows, uh, plural wives of Joseph Smith. One was Zena Huntington and the other one was Lucinda Morgan Harris and told their stories of becoming and being a plural wife of Joseph Smith. Tonight and next week in a light dramatization she will be portraying Emma Smith and will tell her story. I will interview her as if she were Emma herself 
and her answers have all been taken from historical documents, private journals, and news accounts. We're going to focus on Emma Smith's story, not on Joseph Smith's story. So to get started, let me introduce Dorothy Catlin portraying Emma Smith. Welcome, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It's always an adventure. <laughs> it is an adventure. It? And it, it's, it's a lot of hard work on your part. And thank you for, for what you've been doing it. to help this up, including your costume. It's beautiful. <laughs> I think it's always a part of the adventure. It kind of helps me get a, get a clue about the character yeah. as we create the costume. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. It's, it's <clears throat> very nice. It's very nice. We're going to present Emma as a strong, faithful, diligent woman who knew her own mind mm -hmm. and that she loved her husband, even <clears> to the <throat> point of self-deception and denial. Mm -hmm. So, Emma was born July 10th of 1804 in Harmony, New York, to Isaac and Elizabeth Hale. She was their third daughter and the seventh child. So tell us briefly about your home life as you grew up. Well, actually, it was pretty normal for a child of those times in that place. I was the youngest, the seventh, well, I was the seventh child. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother ran an inn and a tavern, took people in. And so we learned to be very self-sufficient. We had, oh, we cured sausages, we made candles, we made soap. We did all those things that, that you had to do. And those skills were going to come in very handy later as I continued to move west into less and less settled territory. Uh, my mother taught us all to read and write. And I went to the local schoolhouse after that was built. And then my father uh, saw that I was smart. <laughs> and so he sent me away to school for a year, an additional year away from my family to, to go to school. Um, one of my older brothers was a river pilot. And so he Ooh. taught me to handle a canoe. And I spent a lot of time on the water as a girl. I handled a canoe well and enjoyed being on the water. Uh, and I loved horses. I, wrote a lot wow. and was a good writer, which again proved to be very handy in some of my adventures with my future husband. Later on with Joseph Smith. So how and when did you meet him, Joseph Smith? Well, that part of the story uh, <laughs> starts in, in 18, mm, 1824. I nearly couldn't remember. <laughs> It's been a long time ago. It's been a long time. We had a distant relative named William Hale who believed that there was treasure buried in the hill just behind our house where I grew up. And so uh, he formed a partnership with a man named Josiah Stoll, who is going to come into the story quite a bit later on. But they decided to hire some men to help them dig because it was a big job to investigate this hill. And, and Mr. Stoll knew the Smiths. And he had heard that one of the Smith sons had this uh, distinctive gift, this ability to see things that couldn't be seen with the natural eye mm -hmm. by using a stone mm -hmm. that he had found. And so uh, when they decided to dig, it was arranged that all these men would come and stay and board at our house. And so uh, Joseph was among them, and that's how I met him. Were you first attracted to oh, him when you first met immediately. him? Oh, <laughs> immediately. He had this reputation as a money digger, although he had never made much money at it. And my father didn't like that. Uh, he regarded it as a form of sorcery. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and he thought Joseph wasn't very well educated. But I liked him immediately. He was tall and he was handsome. Mm -hmm. And he was always <laughs> kind to me. And, uh, so I was very glad. Oh, there's a picture. I was very glad when the digging project was over that Mr. Stoll hired him to be a farmhand. So he was just across the river, and he used to come and, and visit me very frequently. So uh, as we were getting to know each other, he told me of this vision that he'd had in the woods as a 14-year-old, and mm. I believed him. You believed that story. Since oh, I did. Since your father wasn't exactly fond of Joseph <laughs> Smith, how did you end up getting married? Oh, not fond is a mild way of saying it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, when I got up that morning, I had no idea that I would be married by the end of the day. Joseph had asked twice before if, if my father would give my hand to him, but my father had refused. My father kept saying he could see no good in a man who dug for buried treasure or had visions. But... Uh, and, of course, it didn't help at all that Joseph had been arrested the previous year and charged with being a disorderly person and an imposter. And during the trial, then, he had said that he had a stone which he occasionally used to seek for local, uh, to locate sorry, hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth and lost property. And some of the witnesses at that trial swore that he was a fraud and that everything he did was designed to deceive. 
So you can imagine that after that, he was even less welcome in our home. And, but he was persistent. <laughs> oh, he was. <laughs> and, he was. And you were old enough uh, to make up I your I was own 22, <laughs> and I was determined to see him regardless of how my father felt. So uh, one Sunday, when my father was at church, we rode off together. And we were both planning to be guests of our friend Josiah Stoll, who lived across the state line. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were there all day long. Joseph talked to me about marrying him. And Mr. Stoll supported him in it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by the end of the day, I thought, well, I would prefer to marry Joseph than anybody else I knew. And so I consented. So before nightfall. We were married in Zachariah Tarbell's parlor there in South Bainbridge, oh, New York. My and I was so afraid to face my father. We went straight away to Joseph's family's house and moved in with them. And I knew that at least they would approve of the marriage. And they did. <laughs> and they did. How long was it before you finally contacted your family? Oh, it was months. It was probably scary. <laughs> It was months before I would contact my father. I finally wrote to him, but he never forgave Joseph for the way we had run off together. And he did allow me to come home briefly and gather my property. I had left that day, you know, I didn't take any clothing. I had left behind all my furniture. I had a cow. Mm. I wanted to go back and, and reclaim my things. So, but when we first came back, my father said to Joseph, you've stolen my daughter and married her. And I would much rather have followed her to her grave. Mm, wow. Now, eventually, he reconciled himself to the fact that we were married, and he offered us a place to live, but he made Joseph promise that he would give up money digging and glass looking. Uh, and I really think Joseph intended to keep that promise, but he was in great demand. He had quite a reputation as a, as a treasure seeker. So it, it was hard so for him. So that was hard to give that up. It was hard for him. So he promised to give up treasure hunting as an occupation, but instead, he managed to come across some golden plates buried in a hill from oh, well. some angel. I'm not sure it <laughs> happened quite in that order. But, but Joseph told me that when he had first gone to the hill Camorra, the angel, the personage he encountered there, had told him that he could have the record uh, the next September if he brought the right person with him. So Joseph told me that he looked in his glass and he saw that it was me. He saw you, huh? Kind of. He's had a lot of convenient <laughs> revelations, didn't he? Well, were you with him when he finally picked up those plates? Oh, I was. Oh, I was. It was just a few months after we were married. And uh, Joseph said that the time had come for the record to come forth. So one night, our friend Josiah Stoll had come in the wagon with his friend, Mr. Knight. They were delivering a load of wheat, and Joseph saw his opportunity. So after everybody had gone to bed that night, we slipped outside to borrow the wagon. We didn't have their permission, but oh. we thought we could get there and back before morning. Now, Joseph's brother, Lucy, knew uh, his mother, excuse me, not mm -hmm. his brother, his mother, knew we were going because he had asked her earlier in the evening for a, a chest that locked with a key. And so she knew what we were going for. Mm -hmm. She hadn't had one, and she had stayed up all night worrying about it. In any case, we borrowed the wagon in the middle of the night. We hurried to the hill. I waited in the wagon and kept watch and kept the horse quiet while Joseph went to retrieve the plates. And when he came back, he was carrying this bundle. And we stopped halfway home so he could hide it. He found a hollow log and put it in there and covered it up with a, with a piece of bark. Wow. We so, hid it. So when you got back, did anybody know where you'd been or what you'd been doing? No. We said nothing to anyone. But word got out somehow that Joseph had the plates, and it seemed like everyone in the county wanted to see them. Some people even tried to come and steal them. And our friend Martin Harris went to the Hill Camorra and started digging holes everywhere, looking for more buried treasure. His wife, Dolly, made a nuisance of herself, coming to the house, badgering Joseph about the plates, telling us about strange dreams she'd been having. Joseph kept having to move them to keep people from getting at them. It was impossible for him to even start the work of translation mm -hmm. under those circumstances. So. We decided to take up my father's offer and go and live at Harmony. Wow. Now, <laughs> my brother came to help us move, but when we got to my father's house and he discovered that we had the plates with us, he was not happy. He regarded them as more evidence that Joseph was still treasure hunting. Uh -huh. And so uh, he asked to see them. 
of course, and Joseph refused. My father said, if you're going to keep it in my house, I need to see it. Well, Joseph refused, of course, but that confrontation all but destroyed our hopes of any mm -hmm. kind of a real reconciliation with my father. Mm -hmm. So we moved into a nearby house that was on the property so Joseph could begin that work of translation in privacy. And we were waiting for the birth of our first child wow. during that time. So did you ever actually see with your own eyes those golden plates? Well, no. But I wasn't especially curious about them. I trusted Joseph completely, and I believed everything that he had told me. Now, the plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, but they were wrapped in a linen tablecloth that I had given Joseph to fold them in. I once felt them, oh, there's a picture. I once felt them as they lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape, and they seemed to be pliable like thick paper mm -hmm. and, and would rustle with a metallic sound when you ran your thumb over the edge like you do over the edges of a book mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I used to move them from place to place on the table as I would do my work, but I didn't attempt to handle them or uncover them in any way. I was satisfied that that was the work of God, and I, I didn't feel it necessary to actually uncover them and, and look at them. Okay, and at one point, that uh, they lay in a box under our bed for months. I, I never felt the liberty hmm. to look at them. That's interesting. <laughs> Not as curious as a lot of women. <laughs> I know, or people even. Well, Joseph had scribes uh, that would help him, besides yourself, that would help him translate mm -hmm. the plates. Who were the other scribes, mm -hmm. and did he actually translate from the plates themselves? Well, that was interesting. Besides myself, there was Oliver Cadre and Martin Harris, who I already mentioned, and my brother, Reuben Hale, helped sometimes with he the, with the he translation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in writing for Joseph, I frequently wrote day after day, sitting just across the table from him. He would sit with his face buried in his hat with the stone in it, uh, dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. He had neither manuscript nor book to read from. If he had anything of the kind, he could not have concealed it from me. At first, he used what we called the interpreters. They looked rather like old-fashioned spectacles. They were attached to a breastplate. Mm -hmm. But then later on, as I said, he used the stone, which he put in his hat and buried his face in it to block the light. Wow. Oh, wow. So, so the other witnesses um, also confirmed that Joseph Smith put his head in the hat to come up with the text of the Book of Mormon. So the the artist's renditions of Joseph Smith sitting there translating from golden plates then is not accurate. Was, no. you, was your father aware of this translation process? Oh, yes, and he found it intolerable. He regarded it just as more of the same, a pretense of sorcery. And, and he believed, and I'm going to read you this because my father actually published this statement. He believed the whole Book of Mormon was a silly fabrication of falsehoods and wickedness that Joseph was out to dupe the credulous and unwary in order to live upon the spoils of those who swallowed the deception. Hmm. Now, in other words, my own father believed that my husband was a con man and that I was his dupe. Hmm. But I believed Joseph was everything he told me he was. You see, Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate a well-worded letter uh, let alone dictate a book like the Book of Mormon. When I was acting as his scribe, he would dictate hour after hour. And then, you know, we would stop and he would come back after meals or after interruptions. He would at once begin right where he had left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. Hmm. Uh, that was the usual thing for him to do. It would have been improbable that a learned man could have done that, much less one so ignorant and unlearned as Joseph Smith. Wow. Well, about the other scribes, there were other scribes involved with this mm -hmm. process as well. Um, how were you the, the primary transcriber or how much were the others involved with well, this? Well, I was at first, of course, because I lived there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but later on, Martin Harris came to stay with us. And there's, of course, an interesting story that, about Martin Harris. And you know that story. His wife, Dolly, uh -huh. never believed in Joseph or the Golden Plates. And, and you know about the 116 pages that Joseph allowed him to take. Mm -hmm. But the part of the story you may not know is that the very night that Martin took those pages to show his wife, 
I went into labor with that baby that we wow. were expecting. And it was, a, it was a long and a hard labor and I nearly died. And our little son, Alvin, only lived three hours. Oh my. Oh, so over the next two weeks while I was recovering, Joseph became so anxious about the manuscript that I finally convinced him he should go and retrieve it from Martin and not wait mm -hmm. for him to bring it back himself. Mm -hmm. Which Joseph did. He and did. The, and they, the 116 pages were not found. They were purported to have been lost. But then that's, of course, that's like another, say, story. another story for another time. Uh, during your recovery from your son Alvin's birth and then his immediate death, there were more reports that Joseph was seducing other women, mm. and this time it was Eliza Winters. But in spite of his reputation, you continued to believe in your husband. I did. I did. I believed in him completely. But trouble never seemed to be very far from Joseph. And the very night that I was baptized, right after the church was formed, Joseph was arrested again. And again, he was charged with being a disorderly person. He was charged with glass looking and setting the county in an uproar <laughs> because of his preaching of the Book of Mormon. This was in June of 1830. So they were unable to convict him, but he, he was put in jail and put on trial. It was a terrible time oh, for me, yeah. as you can imagine. We had just lost our little Alvin and, and the church was just getting started. Mm -hmm. It was such an ordeal. Uh, but right after that, Joseph received a revelation that was directed completely and directly to me. To you, named you by name. Um, about this time, Joseph Smith did have a convenient revelation to keep you in line is the way that many people would see it and in the faith. And it goes like this. And this is a quote we're going to put up on the screen. It's from the Book of Commandments, uh, chapter 26. The original is, um, is a little different. But anyway, it says, Emma, my daughter in Zion, a revelation I give unto you concerning my will. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called. Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world. Thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph thy husband in his afflictions with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. Continue in the spirit of meekness and beware of pride. Let thy soul delight in thy husband and the glory which shall come upon him. Keep my commandments continually, and a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive, and except thou do this, where I am, you cannot come. Now this revelation is now Doctrine and Covenants 25. It was originally in the Book of Commandments number 26, and the wording has changed. So if you go to check it out in, in today's uh, a book, it's going to be a little bit different because and the normal activity for Joseph Smith's church is to change the wording of God's revelations. Well, how did you react to this revelation? I regarded it as the word of the Lord to me, and I clung to it through all the years to come. It was, it was such a help to me through all the hardships that wow. I would face in the coming years. You know, when someone threatens with a thus saith the Lord command, uh, or hearken unto his voice, like Joseph Smith so often did, <clears throat> and he did in this revelation. People are not aware, I guess, of God's true dealings with man and his true character, and they would be stricken with some kind of fear and scared into obedience. That's the way the Mormon religion is both then and now. But anyway, that's another story. Did your life get any better or easier in harmony? Well, it certainly didn't get any easier. <laughs> It became very difficult in harmony. Our relationship with my father just got worse and worse. It seemed that wherever Joseph went, the rumors and the accusations soon followed. And about that time, my own cousin accused him of misconduct with mm. women. There were all these vicious rumors that he had uh, had unusual ideas about marriage. It seemed like wherever we went, women were attracted to my husband. They found him very attractive. Mm -hmm. And so we wonder if that's where Emma began to deceive herself about her husband's true character. You picked up and you moved several times during your marriage with Joseph Smith and you left Harm Harmony rather suddenly in August of 1830. Why? Tell us about it. That was a hard, hard move for me. 
our ruined relationship with my parents just seemed hopeless. I was carrying another child by that time, but we had buried our little Alvin there by the house where I had grown up. Mm -hmm. I was leaving my own house and all my furniture, all my own things to move in to, um, to move in with David Whitmer's family in Fayette, New York. And then only six months later in January of 1831, Joseph had another revelation that the entire church was to sell all property and move west to Kirtland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. He told us there would be great riches, a land of milk and honey, and an inheritance for us and our children forever. Forever, huh? And of course, Doctrine and Covenants sections 37 and 38 cover uh, part of this information that Emma has just shared with us. And it was an empty promise because it wasn't very long that you were out of there. Uh, you didn't, they, the saints didn't stay very long in there and it certainly wasn't forever and it wasn't flowing with milk and honey. Uh, you had to leave your parents again when you made this move. How mm -hmm. did that affect you? Well, I knew that when I said goodbye to my parents this time that it was probably for good, that I probably would never see them again. Uh, it, it was such an extremely severe winter. I was 26. I was desperately uncomfortable. I was carrying twins, although I didn't know it at the time. I was still weak from an extended sickness the month before. Uh, it was January, uh, early February, uh, but we abandoned nearly all of our belongings and rode over 300 miles in wow. a crowded sleigh over frozen roads. 300 miles to Kirtland. Carrying twins, I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine. That had to have been very uncomfortable and painful at times. So how long did it take you to complete your journey to, to Kirtland? About a month. And along the way, we had relied on inns or on the hospitality of farmers that we encountered along the way. But when we finally arrived, just as we were unloading the sleigh and, and relocating into a wagon to move into our temporary rooms, the horse bolted and I was thrown out into the snow. Uh, I wasn't hurt, but my twin babies were born a little less than two months later and, and they died after a few hours. And I wondered if that long winter journey and then that tumble out of the wagon uh -huh. had had affected them. Wow. I was not hurt, uh -huh. but those babies lived only a few hours. And we named them Thaddeus and Louisa Whoa. before we buried them. Thank goodness. But then, our, the very day after our own twins died, our friend Julia Murdoch died, giving birth to twins of her own. And nine days later, we took them as our own and raised them as our own. From that mm. very day, I raised them as my own natural children. They were named Julia and Joseph. Wow, that's sweet. And we were living in a little log cabin on the Morley settlement mm -hmm. at that point. But a little while later, we moved south of Kirtland to Hiram into the home of the Johnson family. <laughs> Johnson family. <laughs> so within less than a year, Emma had made the difficult break with her parents, endured a strenuous 300 mile journey, adjusted to life in a new uh, town and establishing another home, gave birth to and buried three children and adopted two and all of this in only four years of marriage. More rumors were going around about your husband and his mm -hmm. relationships with other women and young girls. Tell us what happened while you were staying with the Johnson family. Well, we had hoped, we had hoped for peaceful days at the Johnsons, but it wasn't long before there were rumors and then accusations again regarding Joseph. One of the Johnson sons, Eli, I think, suspected Joseph of becoming too intimate with his sister, Nancy Marinda, who was 16, and we were all living in the same house. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's funny or ironic, I guess you might say it, that Nancy Marinda Johnson later became a plural wife of Joseph Smith. I think it's kind of an interesting thing, but what happened? <laughs> mm. Well, our twins had been feverish and sick for days with the measles. And one night in the middle of that, there was a mob attack, probably organized by those Johnson boys. Uh, I was in our bedroom with little Julia and Joseph had taken baby Joseph into another room to rest with him there. And there was this mob of men with their faces blackened that came bursting in and they took my husband out to the yard. I could hear him struggling and grunting and, and hear them all yelling. They tore all his clothes off and pinned him down on the ground. And there was a Dr. Dennison there 
whom they intended to have him castrate my husband. Mm. Uh, and I could hear the yelling. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, but the doctor refused. And so they just poured tar over Joseph's head and they smeared it down his whole body. And then they rolled him in feathers from a tick that they had torn open. And then they just left him hmm. there on the frozen ground. Now, I hadn't seen the whole thing because I was inside trying to comfort my poor sick babies. Mm -hmm. When Joseph finally came stumbling in the door, I looked at him and I thought he was covered with blood. I didn't realize it was tar. And I fainted away completely. Wow. But the worst was still to come because our little Joseph was exposed to that night air for all of that time the front door had been left open. Mm -hmm. And he died about a week later. Oh, our my little goodness. adopted Joseph. One leaves. of the twins mm -hmm. that you had adopted after we your own adopted, twins had died. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then three days after that, Joseph left for a church conference in Missouri and I grieved alone. I spent the next few months shuttling between three different homes of friends because I, I couldn't bear to stay at the Johnsons any longer, mm -hmm. and Joseph was away in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So again, Emma grieved the death of another baby. Mm -hmm. she, she buried four of her first five children and faced continual gossip and rumors about her husband's behavior. But I was again expecting a child, and when Joseph returned, we moved into three storage rooms above the Whitney store there in Kirtland. And our son, Joseph Smith III, was born while mm -hmm. we lived there. That was 1832. We had just enough space to take in boarders, and so uh, that was a way of earning a little extra money, and I began to take in young women who had no other place to live. That uh -huh. was a practice I continued all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't pay them. But they helped with household chores and in return for room and board. Room and board. And it was during those years that Joseph Smith developed relationships with many of the young women, women who would become his plural wives later on. He was already acquainted with many of them. But first tell us about Fanny Alger. Oh, I loved Fanny. She was a sweet girl. I loved her like my own daughter. But Joseph loved her too, and I came to find out exactly how much he loved her a little <laughs> later on. Joseph had met her a few years earlier, but she came to live with us in 1835 when she was 19. Her parents and brothers were members of the church. But, you know, I said that, that Joseph loved her. There was already gossip around town that his affection for her was not just fatherly. But I was used to that kind of gossip. It had been going on for years. But I had come to have real suspicions in this case. How were they confirmed? <laughs> <laughs> well, one night I missed both Fanny and Joseph, and I went to look for them, and I found them alone together in the barn. I saw them together through the crack in the barn door, there in the hay together. I was furious, mm. and I threw Fanny out of the house. Now. Some people later, after Joseph had had his revelation about plural marriage, some people said that Joseph must have married Fanny. But he had said nothing to anyone yet, and certainly not to me, about that form of marriage. Mm, yeah, and, and if it had been a plural marriage with Fanny, uh, wouldn't you think that others, especially his close friend Oliver Cowdery, would have been aware of it? Someone would have had to perform the celestial marriage, if that's what it was. But there was no one who who knew anything about it. No, and, and Oliver was as upset as I was. He called it a dirty, nasty, filthy affair. Now, Fanny found a place with some relatives. Uh, I had thrown her out of the house, and, and I heard that she later got married and had children. I don't know. Yeah. I never wanted to see her again. Yeah, certainly, of course. Um, to calm rumors regarding Fanny's relationship with Joseph, uh, the church quickly adopted a chapter of rules for marriage among the saints. Uh, and that declared, inasmuch as this church of Christ has been reproached with polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife. And this article on marriage was canonized and published in the Doctrine and Covenants. In 1852, however, the doctrine of polygamy was publicly announced, which ended 18 years of this secret practice of polygamy. And at that time, the article on marriage where they did not believe in polygamy became obsolete and, of course, was later removed from the Doctrine and Covenants. But just to be sure, Fanny was sealed to Joseph Smith by proxy in the Salt Lake City Temple in 1899. 
We have a lot more to talk about, Emma, but first of all, we want to open up the telephone lines and invite our viewers to call in, share your comments or your questions uh, about what we've talked about, Emma, so far. Our telephone number is 801-973-8820, 973-TV20. Give us a call and we'd love to talk to you. Uh, and while we're waiting for the calls to come in, we do have our ministry message to share with you. You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we've made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, Free of charge to you is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. Simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. We have plenty. Welcome back to our show, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we are talking tonight with Dorothy Catlin, who is portraying in a light dramatization, Emma Smith, and her story, uh, as we have discovered in uh, much of the history of early Mormonism. Um, Dorothy you can speak as Dorothy right now. <laughs> you have a bibliography that you want to share with our viewers of where you have gotten most of this information. That yeah, I sharing. do. And actually, oh, there it is on the screen. Good. Yeah, probably the primary source is Mormon Enigma, which is an excellent read. Uh, Nauvoo Polygamy by George D. Smith, which is a huge book, but extremely well documented. I really, I've read it twice now, and I really have enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, the Last Testimony of Sister Emma, which I've already quoted from, and there's, there's some more coming. And then there's this excellent article by Grant Palmer, uh, Why William and Jane Law Left the LDS Church, and there is the website for that online. And the segment in there that discusses um, the relationship between William and Jane and Joseph and Emma and uh, all the potential for difficulty there that mm -hmm. we'll get into a little bit next week. Next so, week, right. But those are the primary sources. And then, of course, there's that website, uh, thewivesofjosephsmith.org, at the bottom that has little mm -hmm. little snippets of information about all of the women uh, of that wives. Joseph married. Yeah, And the fact that Joseph Smith was a polygamist, um, which many people, uh, we still talk to people that are mainline Mormon church members who just don't believe mm -hmm. that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. It oh, is so well documented. <laughs> there's no way... Uh, without leaving the planet and living in your own fantasy land, there's no way that you can truthfully deny that he was a polygamist. He was, and there are 33 documented wives other than his first wife, Emma. Our, to our telephone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you. Our telephone number is 801-973-8820. Give us a call and share in our conversation. Um, 
if you'd like. We have, again, we're, we have a lot of information to share with Emma. We still have more tonight, but if we don't get through it all tonight, next week will be Emma part two, and we will share the information that we have uh, for the, the second half of her life, as well as what we don't get covered tonight if uh, we don't get to all of it. But we do have a call coming in right now. Uh, Kimberly is calling from Layton. Hello, Kimberly. Hello. Yes, you're on the air. Oh, I am? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi, what's your question? Um, I, I had a question about sec Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, there is, the section is basically um, um, related to plural marriage, and it is a revelation that Joseph Smith had about Doctrine and Covenants. Um, and it's mostly about Mary. And um, he's telling Mary, uh, you know, that this is a revelation from God. And mm -hmm. um, it seemed like to me, Mary was having problems with uh, polygamy. And that is why he had that revelation for directly towards her. Uh, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> Oh, it was definitely directed towards her. We'll talk about this a little bit next week, uh, but Emma actually is on record in a conversation with William Law as saying that she regarded that revelation as a threat to her life and that she had just better accept it or accept the consequences. Um, and yes, um, there is a part in there saying, you know, if uh, you don't go along with what Joseph Smith says, yeah. you, know, you will be destroyed. Will destroy mm -hmm. you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Um, and Kimberly, do you, do you think that um, a loving God might use those words? No. No. Uh-uh. Kimberly, I was born and raised in a polygamy group, and that very verse that you're referring to continues to be used to all the women that are born and raised in polygamy, that they mm -hmm. must live polygamy or God will destroy them. That's the threat that is used to them today. I, was, I grew up with that threat. So it's okay. there, and it's about polygamy, and it was the revelation on polygamy mm -hmm. that Joseph Smith claimed he received. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Good night. Okay, we have Martin calling from Salt Lake City. Hello, Martin. Martin. Yes. You're on the air. Okay. Yes, I just want to make a comment uh, uh, about Emma Smith's parents, and I believe they her father was a good Christian uh, father, and I believe he pinpointed about Joseph Smith. He had it right on the, 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 the nail head on about his uh, saucer and his witchcraft. And I think that Joseph Smith was also, I think he was worshiping the uh, ideas of the carnal ways. And I think they consumed him and he uh, into his decepts with, let's say, it was the name of religion. I think, I think uh, that he was just uh, oh, that was just a, a front from the go get go, just so he can mm -hmm. have his car wings. Well, I think there's a lot of people who would agree with you with that. I think there's a little more to it than that, but that's part of it. Uh, however, in our dramatization of Emma, we're focusing on Emma's story and not Joseph's. And so we've talked about him and we will be talking about him in other shows and more about Joseph Smith and what his purposes were as well. But Emma's comment? father was not the only person who regarded Joseph's activities as a cult. And, you know, he was repeatedly charged with glass looking and money digging and put on trial. And, uh, you know, and Emma believed in him. Uh, from the earliest days, and, and, and whether it was self, you know, right, self deception, she was or herself yeah. or actually did believe, or maybe, mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, we will. What Emma's thoughts are, but uh, we do appreciate your comments, and I think some of it's true. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm, thanks for calling. Okay. Um, Looks like we've got all the lines full, but no calls yet. So we're, let's talk a little bit about the scandal concerning Fanny Alger and Joseph Smith. It, it caused a lot of dissent and actually excommunications during the 1837 and 1838 uh, church, growth of the Mormon church. Even after Fanny left town and mm -hmm. married someone else, mm -hmm. the ripple effect was still mm -hmm. destructive within the church. So what happened with life in Kirtland? Oh, the scandal and the gossip were terrible. And so so 
though Joseph was traveling much of the time, so he was not there to deal with it. But every time he came home, he found that things were worse. There was this growing discontentment among the church members. Uh, there was gossip about Joseph of every kind. Uh, the bank had failed and property real estate prices were out of control. Uh, even some of his longtime friends were speaking against him and forming rival groups. Mm. They were starting their own churches. During that time, six of the 12 apostles rebelled against his leadership. And finally, things got so bad that one freezing cold winter night, he and Sidney Rigdon left town at 10 o'clock at night on the fastest horses they could find. Oh, uh, I was left behind to pack the wagon. Wow. And I knew that everything I couldn't get in that wagon was just going to be loot mm. for somebody. For someone else. So, I left Kirtland much the same way I had arrived there six years earlier in the dead of winter, carrying an unborn child. Mm. And yet this time the journey ahead of me was 800 miles instead wow. of instead the 300. Of 300. And I had three young children. Julia was six, Joseph was five, and little Frederick was only 18 months old. Now we caught up with Joseph a few days later. They had ridden away very fast, but then they slowed down. We caught up with them, but we had armed mobs following us wow. for 200 miles. Oh my goodness, that would have been frightening. Mm -hmm. That would have been very oh, it scary. Was. It was. So we did finally arrive in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Do you have something you want to say here or shall we go on with the story? <laughs> we have a phone call, a couple oh, there that we oh, ought to take. By so all let, means. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> we have Lisa calling is from Stockton, Utah. Hello, Lisa. Hi. You're on the air. How are you, ladies? We're, we're well. Wonderful. Thank you. Good. Um, I just had a comment. Um, I come down from the line of Alma Smith, Joseph's brother, and I also come from a descent of, of Amanda Smith, who is in um, the Hansville Massacre. And I was raised and told that um, that... Joseph Smith married Amanda Smith because of all the all the women whose family, or, you know, their husbands have died and they hadn't got married in the temple, so he married them so they could all be like eternally married to somebody. But I was taught that he wasn't with all the women, but he just married them for that purpose. I don't know if that's all the way the truth, but that's that I was taught. That is a typical of, of some of the myths surrounding early Mormon polygamy, and it's a lie. That is not why. Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants says that the reason for polygamy was to raise up, mm -hmm. to replenish the earth. In other words, have babies. That's what the reason for polygamy was. So why would he marry all these other mm -hmm. women if it wasn't to have babies? And we all know what people do to make babies. And so obviously uh -huh. there was uh, real marriages taking place, um, at least not legal, oh, but real marriages oh, taking well, place. Well, right. And why would, and we'll talk about this next week, why would Emma and others have been so viscerally opposed yeah. if there was sure. not a, a genuine marital right. relationship to be expected from those yes. that's relationships? True. Okay, well, that's it's been really interesting. Now I have to look some of that up better. Yeah, do. Oh, do. Oh, get Mormon Enigma and read that. It will okay. yeah, change your thinking. Okay, that sounds intriguing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for calling. Okay. Okay, we have Daryl calling from Salt Lake City. Hello, Daryl. Yes, I've got a question for you. I'm just kind of curious as to uh, um, how that you, both of you, would respond to atheists who use the same type of uh, vilification against Christianity and, and the Bible as what I've seen that you've done against the Mormons. I can't even hear him. Can you hear him? The scriptures, immorality yeah. of Bible prophets like David, who had uh, one of his soldiers killed so he could get at Bathsheba. You know. Yeah, we're f fully aware of all of the biblical examples of polygamy, and polygamy was wrong mm -hmm. then, just mm -hmm. like it's wrong now. 
But, Daryl, you said that we're vilifying Joseph Smith and the LDS Church. We're really not. These, this is all just the history. We've put the bibliography on the screen. You can go and read those books and read the documentation. And by the way, the authors of Mormon Enigma and the author of, of Nauvoo Polygamy, they are Mormons. Mm -hmm. They are members of the LDS Church, and they have researched the history. And what, we have, what we're telling you is, is history. It's not vilification. History is simply speaking the facts. Right. And another good book uh, who author is Mormon is uh, In Sacred Loneliness mm -hmm. by Todd Compton. And mm -hmm. he's an author who is also an upstanding member of the Mormon Church. And all he did was research history, mm -hmm. found it, and wrote it down. What's wrong with that? Yeah. What's wrong with it, that? We're just telling you the facts. Okay. All right, so um, let's talk about Far West, uh, uh, the birth of Alexander, Joseph was arrested in Missouri, you leave for Illinois with your children, and Joseph Smith is still in the Liberty Jail. So tell us about your journey to Far West. Well, we, we had really thought Far West would be our Zion. Joseph had said it would be, uh, and our son Alexander was born there. But uh, And interestingly enough, when we first came there, we spent our first two months in the home of Lucinda Morgan Harris and her husband George, mm -hmm. who Lucinda has been here right. on the show with <laughs> she, you. <laughs> she certainly has. <laughs> uh, but uh, that time in Missouri was filled with trouble, both from within the church and from without the church. And then when Joseph was arrested and put in Liberty Jail, I eventually became convinced that he would be released if we left the state. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we did. Um, in February of 1839, we left Far West. And I want to read you something that, that Emma wrote at that time. Uh, she wrote, no one but God alone knows the reflections of my mind and the feelings of my heart when I left our house and home and almost all of everything that we possessed excepting our little children, and took my journey out of the state of Missouri, leaving Joseph shut up in that lonesome prison. But the reflection is more than human nature ought to bear, and if God does not record our sufferings and avenge our wrongs on mm -hmm. those that are guilty, I shall be sadly mistaken. Avenging the wrongs, mm -hmm. That's, that was brought out quite a bit in mm -hmm. a lot of the early Mormon history. So it was 1835, that Joseph began to talk about plural marriage. At first, it was just to his inner circle within the church, but nothing was said publicly. In fact, it was denied publicly. In 1841 in Nauvoo, Joseph introduced the details of his unconventional view of marriage, which progressively included eternal marriage. And in 1842, he introduced eternal proxy marriage and finally open polygamy. So Emma crossed the frozen Mississippi mm -hmm. with her young children to once again start over in an unknown place with practically nothing uh, and without her husband by her side. Mm -hmm. Next week, we're going to be in Nauvoo, mm -hmm. and polygamy becomes a secret pa uh, practice among many of the Mormons at that time and eventually comes out into the open, causing all sorts of problems and upheaval. How would you feel as, as Emma is going to express uh, what goes on in her own heart and mind on discovering that your best friend was pregnant by your husband? How would you, what would you say or do if your husband told you that God commanded him to have many wives? What would you do? Think about that. How would you feel if God threatened to destroy you if you didn't allow your husband to take multiple wives? Next week, we'll look into Emma's life in Nauvoo, mm -hmm. Joseph Smith's death, Emma's decision not to go west with the Brighamite mm -hmm. Mormons, and then her remarriage to a non-Mormon, Louis Bideman, or mm -hmm. Bideman, I'm not sure how, how that's pronounced. So you have uh, put a lot of work in this, um, in, in studying the books and the bibliography, um, and finding so much about Emma that probably you didn't know before, you didn't, hadn't realized, you have a lot of thoughts on, on Emma. Mm -hmm. Do you, what, what probably, I mean, there's a lot of questions to ask, and, and I guess my first one is, has your mind changed on Emma, who she is, and what was she was like 
in your study of her during this? Well, I never really had thought about her much before. Well, actually, that's not true. I had been thinking about her for years since <laughs> we knew we were going to do these shows, and I'd been putting it off. Mm -hmm. But um, I really have thought deeply about her in the last few months while we've been preparing. And I, I've come to the conclusion that she loved Joseph profoundly and probably to the point of self-deception. You know, denial and selective memory are powerful things. Mm -hmm. um, and love is a powerful uh, oh, thing. Oh, very. And she did love him. And they did produce a family together. Mm -hmm. And they did. You know, all the things that she endured, uh, why would you stay except that she she believed in him she had that elect lady mm -hmm. revelation that said she would take delight in the glory that was coming to that him and his. she of course would have a part in that and she would share part of that mm -hmm. and that's true all right let's talk with paula calling from west valley hello paula yes you're on the uh, air i wonder if i misunderstood something when she was talking about the golden you know the golden place and they were uh, rewriting them and uh, he wouldn't let anybody see them and then at the end or near the end he gave them a hundred and some pages why would he do that if they were so sacred oh, or I mis maybe oh, oh. I misunderstood it well no Martin had had just pestered and pestered and pestered to take the translated pages not the plates but the translated okay. pages to show his wife in the hopes that he could convince her to believe. And so Joseph allowed Martin to take those 116 pages to show his wife. And I don't want to go into the whole story, but she, they never came back. And Joseph couldn't reproduce them. He said mm -hmm. that it was because he had been forbidden I to just, reproduce them. I just them. can't imagine him doing that when he was so protective of them for so long and then to do that, I just... Amazed me. It's a, it's a I didn't question. understand no. it either. It's a good it's question. It amazed me that he would do that after he protected them for so long. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's all I wanted to ask. Yeah. Well, it was that, not. And that that's, just to be mind. clear, it was not the plates that he sent with with Mark no, the, Harris. The, it was he gave it was the paper. written translation. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula, for calling. Okay. Well, next week we're going to cover the rest of Emma's story, and we thank you. Dorothy, look You're forward welcome. to next week. And you know, we can't help but grieve with Emma over the difficult and painful life events that she experienced. And we can't help but admire her for her strength, her love for Joseph Smith, her husband. We could wish, however, that Joseph would have been as faithful to his wife as she was to her husband. That he would have searched the biblical text for his guidance from God rather than try to start up his own counterfeit religion. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that God's divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. No one, including Joseph Smith, needs to pray for new or fresh revelation. We need to take hold of what God has already provided for our life, our eternal life, and to live a godly life here. We don't need anything else. We don't need anyone else. We don't need polygamy or polygamy groups or sealed marriages or any of those odd biblical doctor unbiblical doctrines that Joseph Smith introduced into the culture. We could wish that Emma would have also investigated the Bible herself regarding polygamy and prophecies that Joseph Smith gave because if she had, she would have known that golden plates, a restored religion, polygamy, the Book of Mormon, and all of his thus saith the Lord commands meant absolutely nothing when held up to the provision that God gave us in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus is all we need. His death on the cross is what we need. And if we attempt to do what Joseph Smith did and bring other events and other revelations into the equation, works or words into what Jesus has done for us, we lose. Because God will accept nothing and he'll accept no one else to plead our case for us. Just Jesus Christ and him alone. Good night. Mm -hmm.